Hi, everyone, and thank you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for listening. Um, so uh, welcome to, to this webinar on combining arts and science uh, in planning. Uh, I'm Kim. I'm a researcher in the field of planning uh, with a very transdisciplinary and international background, um, always trying to bring different disciplines together. Uh, but I have a high and growing interest in the power of arts in contributing to all of this, especially as my kind of sense of awareness about the urgency of planetary planetary injustice and ecosystem collapse, etc., is increasing, and kind of the hope for uh, being able to deal with that in more creative ways um, is, uh, yeah, is. is kind of still there. <clears throat> so hoping to to find out a bit about that. I'm currently and chiefly carrying out my uh, Marie Sklodowska Curie uh, project Mobile Worlds at the Western Norway University of Applied Sciences. And I'm co-moderating today with my colleague uh, Susa Erventa. She's a professor of practice at Aalto University in Finland, and she works simultaneously also in planning practice. Uh, she has a background in urban planning, sustainability, and organizational sciences. Uh, and you can look up a lot more about us, also uh, our profiles, and also of the wonderful speakers that we have invited um, uh, in the description of the event. We will come to uh, allowing them to introduce themselves briefly in a moment. I just want to take a second to introduce the webinar a little bit. So this is the second part of a series of uh, planning, planning uh, dialogues, exploring the theme of acting for change in urban planning, urban and regional planning, really. <laughs> Um, the series has been inspired by the PhD studies of Suza and myself um, and our experiences in planning practice. And today we really want to explore this topic of uh, the extent to, of the combination of scientific work in academia and the engagement of artistic methodologies in that, which kind of also foster artistic output and artistic engagement of audiences or artistic philosophies and so on. So uh, basically, we are working with the underlying assumption that artistic methods might be more creative and incentivize change um, in, in planning and in reality. But it's also kind of, from our perspective, at least an untested hypothesis. So we're excited to hear what um, our speakers have to say on that. Uh, so I'll start with a short uh, giving uh, the, the guests um, uh, the, the chance to introduce themselves. And then we'll come to a dialogue uh, between the invited speakers moderated by myself and Suza. And then finally, at the end, we'll have about 20 to 30 minutes of a QA and a with the audience. Uh, you can post questions in the chat and we will try to introduce those as well during the Q&A. So first, I'll just uh, jump right in. If you could briefly introduce yourselves as the speakers and share maybe your main interests in relation to this theme of arts and science as well when when you introduce yourselves um sophia greaves can we start with you <laughs> hello um hello i'm sophia i am a postdoctoral researcher working for the post growth innovation lab which is an erc project based in spain um looking at how we can change the ways that our systems work so that they're not dependent upon or generative of economic growth and, um, but I have a mixed background. I was trained as an art historian, and then um, I did a PhD in the history of urban planning as part of a project that looked at urban change between Greco-Roman antiquity and present day. And now I work in post-growth, um, looking at transdisciplinary collaborations between artists and scientists in science and policy-making spaces. So, not urban planning, but issues pertaining to planning um, and the production of evidence that informs planning. Thinking about how the inclusion of artists um, shapes decision making processes and generates new narratives for environmental problems, um, more focused on hope and living alongside them than kind of doom and gloom. Um, and as well, how that can lead to applications of technology that aren't focused on growth. Um, and I've, I've looked at that through ethnographic research at the Joint Research Centre, which is the European Commission's Knowledge for Policy Service. Cool, thank you. <laughs> um, Sophia Wiebeck, can you uh, go on? 
Yes, hello everyone. Uh, yes, my name is Sofia and I'm a researcher and I'm based at the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm uh, at the Division of Urban and Regional Studies. Uh, and I'm also affiliated to something called the Center for Studies in Practical Knowledge at Södertörns University, also in Stockholm, uh, that works with philosophical perspectives on knowledge. Um, and you can say my research deals with the intersection between urban planning practice, uh, art, and uh, practical and embodied knowledge in relation to issues about sustainable transformation in planning practice. Um, and um, yeah, I will also say that before I started my, my PhD and my research, I worked as a practitioner work and worked a lot with um, citizen dialogues and citizen participation in different ways. Um, and um, connecting to the theme, um, I'd say that one part is that I have been working as part of my PhD. I did used artistic methods uh, in my PhD. I can come back to that later. Uh, but also that uh, I've been part of a, or I am part of a project, um, research project that works with um, uh, designed lived environments and the relation between yeah public uh, urban places and uh, the role of art. And this will, has led to the uh, start of a new post-master course at the University of Arts and Crafts and Design in Stockholm that will start in September. And it's a course for practitioners within the field of arts and urban planning. Uh, and I'm also uh, one of the... Um, uh, managers for a research school at KTH called Transplace that works with deep sustainability transformation of urban planning practice. And the school has seven PhD students and two postdocs uh, that works with like practice and action based research. And several of them are using uh, artistic methods in their work. Uh, so, yeah, so that's some perspectives. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, thanks to both Sophias for, for coming again. <laughs> um, uh, Marcos, could you uh, be next? Thank you. Of course. Well, thank you, Kim and Susa, uh, for organizing this, uh, also for uh, the invitation and for my colleagues for presenting themselves. I'm very, very happy to be here. So I am a postdoctoral researcher in the area of architecture and urban planning at the PC3 group at the Faculty of Architecture of the University of Sao Paulo in Brazil. Our group is called the Critical Thinking and Contemporary City Research Group of uh, background and uh, architectural history and uh, theory. So my most recent research focuses on singular collective housing initiatives in Sao Paulo. Uh, also, um, I did an approximation with cases from Madrid, which is, is a place I have been researching last year in connection to the project, uh, as both of them offer alternatives to the hegemonic and highly commodified models that are currently practiced in the cities, following um, some decades ago, some very interesting um, uh, ways of, of deploying and thinking how a housing could um, be organized in a very progressive setting uh, at the very end of the dictatorial regiments in both countries. Um, I'm uh, specifically focusing in the redevelopment of alternative groundscapes. And what I argue is that uh, the ideas that emerge from these projects are very closely articulated to a body of knowledge that has been evolving since the 1980s, um, but uh, has uh, largely remained at the margins of history. So um, what I'm talking is about stories that have been occluded, rendered inoperative and discriminated due to their history of struggles for the right of housing, which is uh, the main focus, which is in Brazil constitutional right. Uh, but we're also talking about the right to the city, which uh, is I think in the discussion worldwide, I think right now, which uh, has gained and gained a lot of relevance recently. Um, I find it very interesting um, at, at one of our, Thinking about um, this webinar, I thought um, there are some very interesting links between what I'm studying is and, and the formats of uh, research that uh, I think we're going to approach during this webinar. 
Um, this relates not only to, uh, I'll call it hardcore research, as the academia, academia sometimes likes to uh, see itself, I think, but also uh, about uh, other ways of performing and acting as a scholar and uh, um, um, an architect throughout my career. I have a history of an effort uh, put through research to engage with architecture through different means. Uh, we have to go to listen, to try to see things differently. Um, I'm currently part of the Curatorium, which is this international exhibition, uh, celebrating 100 years of the Weissenhof Siedlung. And uh, in the past, uh, mainly, I had tried to uh, approach this through work on the ground. I have uh, worked a lot with field work with a curatorial work and experimental design initiatives. So working on the ground, I have come to uh, know community initiatives to later reflect on the knowledges they produce. I have two books on this, Microplanning and Handmade Urbanism. Uh, through curatorial work, we showcased uh, work we had been doing at a very experimental level in uh, Rio de Janeiro, but also at the Venice Biennale and at the whole Rotterdam Architecture Biennale and at the Sao Paulo Biennale, which I curated in 2017. Um, mainly in Sao Paulo to forge uh, connections between the ideas of a gallery space and also what's being actually practiced on the ground and spatialized in the city at large. Uh, and, and Sao Paulo is indeed a, a very a large city, but also a very unequal city. So it uh, shows lots of patterns of uh, social in exclusion and uh, climate emergency, as you said in the beginning, yeah. um, articulating practical and discursive um, ideas, I think. And then through uh, design activities that uh, we have uh, developed with the go to open to possible forms of association between people that are working already on different topics on the ground, community initiatives and architects, um, because uh, we found them to be acting and working very far away from each other. So trying to forge experimental platforms through which we mm -hmm. could collaborate. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that. And Reine, if you could uh, go next, please. Thank you. Yes, th thanks for having me. I'm Reine Mentoslo, Professor of Strategic Urban Planning from Aalto University Helsinki, the same unit as, as Susa, also uh, as Professor of Practice. With us, uh, yes, my my own interest or one thematic that interests me in, in this uh, science art interface is, is the this related to my professorship about about dealing with uncertain futures and we have a, in in my team we have uh, some researchers and also in the real estate economics group also a team of researchers working on futures studies uh, related methods on on dealing with different uh, uh, how to how to handle uh, different possible and plausible uh, futures for spatial planning and for real estate uh, development and and expand the perspective for from uh, forecasting which is the kind of traditional approach to future that you uh, study uh, statistical information of previous uh, uh, previous trends in population development in in different travel modes development car ownership and GDP and 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 such and then you extrapolate that in into several decades and that that is the way you deal with with the future and maybe you can change if, the, the figures a little bit and provide different alternatives, but um, but uh, that is as as we know the criticism related to that kind of scientific perspective in a sense that you generate scientific knowledge about past trends and then extrapolate that into future that and that it tends to pro produce its own futures and uh, especially if we talk about. Uh, transport planning, how they anticipate uh, travel demand uh, uh, development on the basis of these uh, historical trends they used to in this anticipate that they tend to provide uh, uh, 
uh, transport infra to accommodate the extrapolated growth in in especially car-based travel and they produce the kind of future and then on the other hand when we have been having to deal during those last few years with different sorts of crises the pandemic and then the war in ukraine and energy crisis and people have become more and more aware of, about the uncertainties related to future we need to we need to have different sorts of methods especially if we aim to tackle these uh, uh, climate crisis related issues in a bit longer term that we we accommodate uh, and and try to manage the crisis and risk but still we need to have a certain long term uh, goal to to enable our living in this in this planet also in the, in the future we we need to have a, a more rich perspective towards uh, possible futures than just just this kind of science based forecasting and there w these artistic methods if you like uh, the use of artistic methods uh, here uh, in terms of foresight uh, using different uh, developing different kind of explorative scenarios which which utilize very much uh, creativity imagination uh, storytelling uh, of different plausible uh, future uh, trajectories uh, that are kind of coherent and plausible uh, in themselves but which need to imagine uh, uh, not just utilizing trends but also imagine uh, the effects of identified weak signals and and then those wild cards as well that might emerge in in the future so that requires imaginative and creative mm. work uh, develop into a kind of plausible narrative format and uh, especially here there is definitely a need for artistic methods in better accommodating ourselves to different possible futures great thank you great uh, what a nice panel we have here today with us so do jump right into the dialogue and feel free to also comment the thoughts of each other during the discussion here. So let's start with the relevance of art in planning in general. So if you reflect uh, shortly on your own background, to what extent would you say that the academic work on planning should employ this kind of more art artistic methodologies or artistic outputs or engagement or even maybe artistic philosophies and such? And maybe you could even shortly give an example of what kind of art are you thinking about when you are faced with these kind of questions. So uh, if we now start, for example, from, from Sophia Bieber. Um, yes, um, this is of course a very big question with many answers. Um, but uh, as some of you already said, I think my perspective is also that um, I think that artistic methods can help us in um, relation to creating or imagining different alternative futures and in relation to sustainability transformation. I also think it's open up for a broader perspective or view of what knowledge is. So not if we use I mean, the concept of Aristoteles concept is not only epistemic knowledge, it's also practical knowledge and phronesis and techne, and that we can include this bodily knowledge, practical knowledge, embodied knowledge. Um, and I think this is very important in relation to create action, that many artistic methods can open up to include the body both the body of the researcher, but also the body of the, the persons maybe you include in your research. Um, and I think if we want to engage or create change, I think this is necessary, that this is not enough with statistics or numbers and data, that we also need to, to include our bodies in this process. Um, I also think that another aspect of art is that it can create a defamiliarization that you can use it as a way of making the familiar strange 
for the strange familiar um, as a way to, to create a space for unknowing, uh, for temporary disorder, uh, where you can get away from your routine ways of understanding a situation or a practice. And from there also maybe view issues or questions from another angel and so on. Uh, and to give you an example, as part of my PhD, I, or the background was, as I told you in the beginning, that I worked with conducting citizen dialogues as a practitioner in different Swedish municipalities. Uh, and after a while, I got very critical towards that practice. Not everything, but a lot of it. Um, so when I came um, to start my PhD, I wanted to both reflect cr critically <laughs> over what I've been working with, but also to try, try out something else and try out to um, explore other ways of conducting dialogues. Uh, so I did a project called Rehearsals together with an artist called Petra Bauer. Um, so for one year, we um, we created eight what we call acts, but you can also call it like workshops, um, where we invited 30 people um, that in different ways had been in engaged in the citizen, citizen planning and dialogues in different ways. Uh, and during these acts, we invited different, different artists <laughs> to, to uh, make different kind of methods where we engaged in these dialogue settings, but would focus on the politics of listening. So we, we like def we created a room that were kind of a dialogue room, but we changed certain aspects. So we had really um, instead of speaking, uh, we spoke of course a little bit, but the focus was on listening. Um, and through this process, I think we, we tried to, to create this, we talked about like displacement, we tried to displace the room and the, the situation in different ways. Also how we like use the space and how we, we furnitured the space and how we acted in the space that we had to take off your shoes and you had to like do some certain rituals every time. And then every each time we used different methods. Um, so this was a way to, to using artistic methods in a way to, to uh, defamer, defamilarize these uh, dialogue situations and uh, to put light, to reflect upon how you used to do. So not only to reflect upon how you can do otherwise, but also to get a room where you can reflect uh, when you do something differently, you also get a, like a perspective on how you used to do things. So that was really something that came up that people started to reflect a lot about. Oh, when I usually have these dialogues, I used to do like this and this. So it, it came up a lot of reflections about uh, your habits and how you used to do things. Um, yeah, so that's one way of thinking what art can do in a like, research setting. Thank you, Sophia. Very interesting. So, uh... Raina, what do you think about what Sofia just said and um, about the art overall in planning? Mm. Yeah, it's good that uh, Sofia uh, added a note on on the on the scientific philosophical approaches uh, that, that there there are many of those, not not just one, and and. We can regard all of them scientific in their different ways. I think it's a mistake of thinking that a scientific approach is just one type of approach. There are many, and and in themselves, some of them are kind of more artistic, if you like, or have have the characteristics that we associate with artistic research. Uh, but there is a certain the rigorousness that we, we when we are doing research utilizing these methods and and these scientific philosophical paradigms that kind of enable that, that there is certain rigorousness and certain control related uh, to those methods if we are talking about action research or action design research which is kind of a com a combination of action research and design research or 
constructive research, which is, has been developed in the field of economics, that you are kind of experimenting, pro producing something, uh, and then you are kind of testing uh, whether it solves certain aims and problems that you place yourself in the first place and kind of have, have a certain auditing related to the production that you make. So that there, there are these research approaches that have these kind of productivity and creativity aspects into them that, that we should be aware of uh, before kind of jumping into these uh, dualistic dichotomies between science and art. I think there's a lot of uh, area in between those that, that you can kind of uh, connect these two and, and there are these interface areas that I would still call kind of scientific approaches if we allow us ourselves to think more broadly of, of different approaches to, to research and, and in relation to, to the forecasting approach and these explorative uh, foresight approaches that I mentioned, uh, the latter one of imagining uh, being creative about plausible future developments, uh, they each have their different kind of theories of truth. So this forecasting approach has this correspondence theory of truth that the validity of such knowledge is um, is kind of measured in terms of to what degree does the statistics, the trend, uh, trend uh, uh, represent, representation really correspond with the kind of real trends that and developments that are out there. But but with this kind of future storylines, ex exploring possible plausible futures. It's about um, uh, coherence theory of truth. It's rather the inner consistency of your storyline and, and how it relates to existing beliefs and develops kind of plausibility through that uh, coherence and inner consistency in itself that determines whether it is valid knowledge or not. So. So there are different approaches within so-called science as well that, that we can we can study and, and thereby see artistic to a degree in themselves. Thank you, Rainer. So uh, if we go next to Sophia Gris, uh, what do you think about this? Uh, would you have maybe some examples of other kinds of arts than design and performance that we already heard about here? Um, I have many things to say in response to these things. I um well first I, in general yes of course i think art is really important to the creation of mind for researchers um doing art and thinking through art allows us to come to know subjects in different ways and that's why it's so important to the doing of science with art um which is what my research is about because the process of thinking about subjects and using artistic methodologies allows us to destabilize as we said our in particular cartesian ways of dissecting and approaching uh, problems um so I suppose in my work, I, I use a lot of mapping and collage because it allows me to see relationships in new ways. Um, and also giving knowledge those forms such as collage offers an accessible means for broader audiences to engage with and know a subject. Um, and, you know, in so doing, you can also co-create with others to create shared meaning and objectives through the process of of doing art, which is obviously very important to planning, participatory planning, etc. Um, I also have a reflection on the framing of, you know, to what extent, um, and this idea of uh, to what extent is employing artistic output in ac academic work useful? Because I think it really encourages almost a kind of measurement mindset, which is what we want to get away from. Because to determine what extent it is useful to be artistic, this question has historically really been asked by non-artists and measured according to certain types of utility. So um, if we're seeking to try and develop explorative scenarios and maybe thinking about intangible outcomes and unknowns, unknown knowns, etc., um, perhaps we can think about how we can employ art rather than to what extent is it useful to be artistic. Um, 
so my, my work uh, looks at how artists and scientists working together come up with different methodologies. So it's not necessarily applicable to planning, but there's a really lovely example of um, citizens co-producing knowledge on plastic waste, which I'm going to share with you in the chat now, um, from the Thayat project at the European Commission. And the, the purpose of that project is really to get uh, bring different epistemes together to explore um, problems from a post-normal perspective. So post-normal science is a kind of approach that thinks that way. Um, and in this case, it was an artist, J.D. Whitman, working with um, scientists on nanoplastic indicators. And she developed these workshop methods where citizens would collect their own waste and um, create these plastic sheets that then she makes into immersive tunnels. And the work is about allowing um, encouraging citizens to gain an embodied understanding of plastic waste, their own waste, by transforming it with their own hands and also being inside these tunnels. Um, I don't know if it's coming up um, on the page, but you should be able to see that they're very like kaleidoscopic aquarium-like environments. Um, so creating a kind of sense of wonder is something that art does really well, and, and that can foster like knowledge absorption um, of particular issues and also mediate difficult issues like like contamination. Thank you, Sophia. That's an amazing example uh, in the chat. So, uh, Marcos, how does all of this resonate with your work? Thank you, Susa. Um, I think it resonates a lot. I also have uh, lots of maybe comments and, and questions. Uh, I totally agree with what um, Sophia just said. Um, in terms of, it's it's very often that people ask how can art or how can different approaches be useful for research, and uh, actually there's a, a very good uh, a paper text by Tim Ingold, uh, the anthropologist, uh, where he's actually uh, shooting that question right back to uh, research itself. Uh, saying, okay, so why do we not uh, turn it around and ask uh, research, uh, why is it useful and important? And how can it be useful and important, depending on how it is uh, performed? So I think um, this is all related to this, um, and this reminds us of this uh, idea of the division between art and science, which is embedded in our culture, and um, um, an idea that science has to be exact, objective, uh, follows a strict method, uh, whereas uh, art is something creative, subjective, and um, doesn't necessarily um, follow any kinds of formal rules, right? And uh, and the uh, treasure from the uh, Center of Ethics of Stanford is discussing uh, this by picturing something that she says as a misunderstanding of what science actually looks like uh, nowadays uh, in practice. What also Tim Ingold um, argues is that science is not about following necessarily a strict algorithm-like method, but about um, how we make uh, judgment, how uh, we can think uh, outside of the box, right, and creatively, and try to um, put in perspective the possibilities of um, yeah, moving forward, right, trying to find something new from things that are um, in this world looking like something that is settled uh, maybe it is but that we can also unsettle so i find this um, line between art architecture planning to be blurred in many ways uh, as the ways of uh, pursuing research in relationship to the performing arts but also to um, i'm saying this because we're talking about planning right but we are moving back to arts to talk about planning because it helps in so many ways because it helps us blur this line and and then see that things can actually expand and and and, and shrink and this allows us in, in a membrane like uh, way to to rethink how how we can discuss how research is done so i think it's also important to say that in my case i'm studying brazilian cities or uh, I've, I've also uh, done research in cities of the south. Of, I'll keep it this way. It's not so simple, but um, many different cities from the south of the hemisphere, the globe. Uh, so we are directly um, discussing uh, issues such as inequality, poverty, precariousness, 
or what um, Abdul Malik Simon and, and Simon Peterson called the precarious now, right? So this condition which is right there outside in the city which we're dealing with um, and uh, which is not something that is very far away, but I think by means of research that allow us to engage uh, different ways, different ways, we um, we should or we find a way as researchers to actually try to experience and understand what it means to be producing in this precarious now. He's, of course, uh, referring to uh, different cities and countries in the African continent, uh, but this also relates directly to the condition that we uh, we find in Brazilian cities, for instance. Um, I have some uh, referential ideas that I think are worth uh, mentioning. So we can think on the one side and um, work that I like for a very long time uh, from a Berlin-based photographer who's called Beate Gutscho. I don't know if any of you uh, know her. She's, she has uh, many series, one of them related to the idea of the brave new world, which is uh, seeking to question art practice um, through a very methodologic approach, I would say. So she's trying to capture photography beyond realism and digitalizing in one of the projects analog photograph, cutting out details, taking them back together, making landscapes that uh, follow the way of uh, painting that uh, artists would use in the Baroque of the 18th century. And through a very exact and precise exercise of montage, uh, she extracts anything that is alive from the picture. So people, nature, um, and the result is that we see an image that looks very uh, strange, also looks very strangely familiar to also connect with what uh, uh, Sophia Vivek was talking about. So this idea of uh, defamiliarization, I think it's from uh, from Pereira and from this magazine of Anana Rai was talking about this, something that you're looking at it, but it, it, it's really weird in a way because it's not what you know. So it's not the buildings that, um, the, the buildings from modernity that have been built in the city, but it's actually something else. Why? Because it's been uh, extracted, right? From... Uh, anything that is alive and therefore also um, generates an image of disorientation but also desolate constructions functioning in a way as a very critical uh, tool to, to think about what actually we have deployed as planners as architects and, and uh, from this idea of the city that has been built so this looks like a very researchy like artistic uh, approach right um, and uh, I'm playing and, and using the word researchy because uh, this uh, also goes along with a trend. Uh, we have seen lots of artists working with this. We can also see this in the work of Orozco, who very clearly goes into uh, picking up and selecting things um, from the city or from the ground or from different landscapes and then reassembling them into a new setting. Uh, inside a gallery. So this resembles traditional approaches uh, that we can easily think as uh, art or research or art research. Uh, but I think there are a lot of other uh, practices that offer alternative ways of thinking creatively, articulating with research yet less in a le yet less direct way because they are not aimed at being called uh, research. So with regard to my own curatorial research in the uh, Sao Paulo Biennale, I'll be very brief I think there are at least three uh, ways of seeing how art can impact our way of uh, thinking about the environment and also how in our discipline we can um, mm. uh, profit. Profit is a horrible word, but we can gain from that. So art that allows contact, bodily face-to-face -face collaboration, the performative aspect of space, uh, as uh, we have fragments urban and the theater pieces in public space, then art that makes something visible, uh, such as in the warriors that uh, artist Virginia de Medeiros photographs, the women, which are the main characters behind social movements, uh, struggling for housing in the city, and art that allows for engagement uh, with people through different media, like sound walks. We have a work from Lauren Tortil from France, uh, which is called Remaining Observant, in which uh, she created huge earplugs that allow for people to perceive the soundscapes of Sao Paulo. So all of this um, 
pieces, I, I think, uh, provoke people into understanding something new. Maybe they review a new truth. They transform the experience of people by uh, this very engagement or something. Mm. Uh, I'm I'm going to to go in there. I think it, we we're hearing really awesome examples as well. So I'm really glad uh, for that. Um, I'm uh, I find it uh, I think this this useful question that Sophia Greaves raised is is really um, of course a challenge a bit to to what we're discussing here. But I think at the same time. Um, what Susan and I also intended was to to kind of try to challenge ourselves to imagine what uh, how, how art can be integrated in different things that we do, right? And what that can look like. Uh, so I think that um, this is and and of course then the usefulness is, is and and measurements and so on go far more into the the scientism sort of that that we might get into in a second. I just um, we. In terms of of time, I just want to ask you maybe each uh, for one uh, thought on uh, what a challenge or a, or actually a, a sort of downside of incorporating arts might be in in sort of uh, research. Um, just just keeping it brief so that we can touch on all our topics, but just to yeah uh to see a bit of the other side because i think we've seen a lot of positive effects here so far and that's really great but what could be a challenge um so reine do you have one <laughs> you know i think that the rules is a is a channel challenge what are the rules of incorporating artistic approaches in in your research and how to assess whether you have a resolved the issue and answer to your research questions through these artistic methods and how to assess the quality of your artistic research. Yeah, good. Point. Maybe others have answers that there are rules, <laughs> but <laughs> for me, it has been a long standing problem uh, that has been debated for 25 or mm. 30 years that it still remains a, a difficulty how to how to come up with the with the rules how to assess such research Sophia Griefs do you do you have a reaction to that and and your own <laughs> it's just nodding strongly <laughs> um well I have two things I guess yeah so from my perspective um interviewing policymakers it, it relates very much to the rules of yes you can have these exploratory art based research spaces but then how do you apply and integrate that into a normal working practice when the systems are such that you know um we have certain types of ways of expressing evidence and applying knowledge um so how can you devise a hybrid structure where you can do art and that is useful work um in the context of science mm. um and I, I guess in relation to that I, it's not a con but it's more of a caveat which is um to do with the positioning of artists within these spaces because if we decide to do art or engage an artist in in the research process there's the kind of risk of of treating the arts as tools for science um the idea that art is a tool for research outputs as they are rather than as intrinsic to the process of thinking through the research questions um which kind of undoes the undermines even the the point of thinking differently um through that mm. Sophia have you big do you have thoughts yeah I agree with what Sophia just said I think also it's a danger when when as I can see among like my colleagues and so on that it getting more and more popular to like engage with artistic practices and artistic methods uh, and the danger that it could be like um, something that gets instrumentalized that yes oh we want to create change we okay we invited an artist so it's, that can help us with this uh, and then this instead of like <laughs> understanding that if we are going to create that kind of uh, methods or engagement we also need to be open and see what happens in the process yeah yeah i i see i can really see that um marcus do you have a reaction in in that sense or another challenge because i think those have been really good points yeah. 
Maybe very briefly. So if, if research, as in God's says, is this renovated inquiry into things, so it's a way of living curiously, and he says with care and attention, right? Then artistic like ways can be, if as Heiner said, right? They can be followable, reproducible in terms of uh, the methods. Then what we, what the results of uh, those practices are can be and should be usually very differently. And as such, um, I think artistic methods uh, may reveal evidence of planning methods that are problematic yet hegemonic or uh, hegemonically practice. Um, I think there's a, a great power in that, in provoking one to um, seeing things differently and through that making the right questions or make, making different questions over things that we take as granted. So um, I think the idea to see things differently and to find new ways of um, operating uh, goes to the very uh, base of how we inquiry and, and develop research. I think this also connects directly with what uh, Sophia Gris was saying in terms of uh, not um, utilizing art uh, for some specific part or for the outputs of research, which has become very common, but rather uh, uh, thinking about how to integrate it in the process so as to actually get different answers. Yeah, uh, very interesting perspectives. Our next question would have been a bit about scientism, but I think we already covered that part as well. So maybe we can skip the question and go to the, the very foundational question of all this webinar series, which is about acting for change. So what do you think, to what extent would this more arts-based or more scientism-based approach uh, be more inclined towards motivating change versus this kind of a more conservative perspective and um, what do you think what kind of a change it could be that these different perspectives could somehow encourage so um, if we I think Reine maybe could start here yes of course artistic activity as different sorts of activism can be very transformative and 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 change our views but but is it research then it's a different kind of activity I, I i suppose you can do research about it of of course but but as such this kind of artistic activity is, is something else as a kind of a transformative societal force but of course if we think about creativity and and transformative creativity in terms of thinking out of the box and 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 critically identifying certain path dependencies and institutional obstacles in making a big societal transition and and moving to for example towards more more sustainable futures we we need creativity and 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 maybe as as uh, as it it was said by by marcos that artistic approaches can open our eyes to see issues differently and 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 kind of relocate our our kind of research agendas by kind of offering us different perspectives to to issues and enabling us to think differently so in terms of positioning our research to tackle kind of more critical issues definitely our art would have a place uh, a necessary place there in my view Well, I um, I think it's it's really nice that you um, bring up this question of whether art is then counts counts really as research or not. Um, but I think that we have at least two, if not three, uh, speakers here that have done literally that <laughs> using that to do research because it's one thing if if art is an outcome maybe of research or if it's something done in parallel. But I think here at least. 
Sophia Greaves and Sophia Wieberg, both of you have have used the art in you know the actual process of of research. Um, just to to break a bit the pattern of of who speaks next, I would I would give Sophia Wieberg the the chance to maybe say something in that sense. Um, yes, there's many ways to to um, answer this, but one way is that I think that I mean all every method, although you use artistic method or ethnographic methods or whatever you use, um, are always part of like shaping the words. It's also intense to describe. So I don't see methods as something neutral. <laughs> um, so even if you use ethnographic methods, action research or artistic methods, uh, we are also always a part in this specific social, social material setting that uh, values, et cetera, that are parts of shaping what may emerge. So uh, there's this uh, research, feministic research duo called Gibson Graham that writes that researcher has a constitutive role in the worlds that exist and the power of bringing new worlds into being. Uh, and this implies a research responsibility of reflecting on what kinds of worlds you want to be part of co-creating. So I think this is, yeah, it, if you work with, even though if you work with artistic methods or some other kind of methods, you always need to be reflective around what are you doing, <laughs> what you have to reflect about your ethical considerations, et cetera. Um, yeah, so that's one way of answering it. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, Sophia Greaves, do you want to react to that? Um, yeah, I guess it, it comes down to the difficulty of defining what is and isn't art as well. Um, and I know that art-based research is very much driven by this sort of democratizing agenda, like change-based agenda. Um, but I also think when we're talking about you know, would arts-based or scientism-based approaches be more inclined to motivating change? It's, it's important not to generalize because artists like scientists have motivations and objectives. They are agents um, in the production of knowledge and therefore, you know, it's not that all artists are green oriented, etc. cetera. Um, it's not a homogenous group to think of art and science in the same way, you know. Um, and there are many different types of market-based practices, etc. Um, which I think is also a Gibson Graham thing, this kind of the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot of other art going on that we don't see or things that we might not classify as, the art world would not classify as art. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's all I want to say on that. <laughs> yeah, it's a really good point. Thanks. I think, uh, Marcos, I've been, I've been kind of leaving you for last <laughs> a lot, but I think it also comes from, well, it comes from the dynamic, but I think it's, it would be really interesting to from from your perspective to see so how is that in um in architecture or in your background more from from that side um kind of to yeah to think is it would you say that then how do you see research in that is that is is you know is that is architecture itself art <laughs> or or where where does that you know come in how do you see that yeah um, um i think our architecture is, sees itself and finds itself in very different ways so sometimes it is more or sometimes less connected to art um i, I wouldn't say it's one thing or the other but um i was very i can talk about my personal experience with this right so i was very uh, lucky to um have worked um, not only in and with research institutes, which uh, do most of its research related or, or following up uh, the methodologies that are at hand, but also to get different grants that allowed me to uh, extend uh, in a way, in some ways wildly, <laughs> what we could do. Um, in my own research what I found out through uh, something that also takes a long time I think which is uh, the contact with uh, uh, people on the ground doing different kinds of activities and depending on the projects that we were carrying out um, along with reading and then getting to understand different aspects of uh, this work on the ground well what I have been learning is that uh, 
through this contact, which Ingot, and again, I'm, I'm quoting him, is uh, talking about the correspondences which are possible, right? So he's talking about the uh, um, possibility to join in the pursuit of truth as a way of knowing in being. So through this practice of curiosity, of care. So what he's talking about basically is that um, we can focus on excess. It's a very good text of uh, Maria de la Cadena also talking about that. So if you focus on excess, we can also try to find ways of opening up to learn how to read it, right? Uh, we um, had collected in many times uh, different, what we call sometimes insights from different people and, and groups uh, trying to um, take care um, and, and carefully listen to what people that were also part of the research in a way what they were thinking so completely different things than what we were doing at some point we did uh, several posters that were collecting those ideas because it shifted completely the way we were seeing things as researchers as architects as practitioners uh, and it also allows us to or allowed us to understand how things were being received right so uh, a very chaotic process maybe uh, also with lots of disagreement which is something i think rather important when you are trying to uh, bring together things that actually collide i think uh, richard senate talks about this uh, disagreement as a way of producing knowledge right um, and also something that sometimes is very disorganized so we can try to organize it by means of uh, adjusting it to methodologies that already exist. I think the good thing in that is that in doing so, uh, we manage in research to kind of indicate uh, the uh, places where um, methodologies can also be commented on, which I think is very useful. Yeah, definitely. Um, I think there's there's so many things I want to to keep asking, but we we wanted to give enough space for Q and A, and I think it'll just kind of keep going on that. So there will be still sort of um, yeah, the conversation will hopefully just just uh, move on from there. So there's actually a question here, uh, Manolo. Would you like to speak yourself? Uh, perhaps your question that would be fine if you want. Yes, thank you so much for giving me the, the opportunity. I'm, I'm from the Department of Sociology in the University of Sevilla, Spain. Um, I work on, on social inequality and social stratification. Very interested in what you all are doing. Um, I'm very following uh, some of the projects that some of you have been involved. Um, um, I'm seeing a lot of how art and science can be merged in many different disciplines and especially around uh, natural science and also more recently on climate change, very, very uh, important topics, um, as well as uh, I'm discovering many others uh, around the urban development. But um, my question is around how um, how art and science can be also merged in more abstract and data, hardcore quantitative data-driven uh, research, like social inequality or social stratification. Um, and also if you are uh, aware or you know about any project that are specifically addressing that and not only uh, around data visualization uh, experiments, but like a proper merging of art and science around that topic. And I would appreciate it. Thank you so much. Anyone volunteer to pick that up? <laughs> Thank you, Manolo, for your question. Um, okay, then I'll just pick on Marcus since you were always last. So... <laughs> oh, or Sophia, you had... Uh... <laughs> go ahead Sophia Graves you you raised your hand so yeah. no I do this when nobody speaks I just put my hand up <laughs> I'm I can I'm sure other people have better things to say than this but I just my initial thought was that well arts-based research is born of social sciences and you know there's quite a lot of um I can send in the chat this you might find approaches in here that resonate with with what you're doing and um find some things that are applicable to, to your research as you say like it's a more quantitative thing um I don't know of any projects that are doing that specifically is it Raina do you do you have something to say yes 
I, I don't have an answer to give and, and, and no references uh, to, to offer, but I, I have, a, have a question. What is missing in present, present research on social strati stratification and, and uh, segregation, etc., related social studies? Uh, is such research and research traditions that address this issue, are they somehow incomplete or missing something essential leading to results and insights that do not really fit or are unsatisfactory. Where would be the need for an artistic approach in present research, how they are doing research? Manolo, yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. Well, I think that um, it, it's not about uh, discovering or solving one specific problem that they are trying to address like in comparative social research we, we compare social inequality using Gini coefficient and other social inequality um, uh, indexes and, and composite indicators uh, we also work in intergenerational uh, transmission of poverty and social mobility um, and we have a lot of data we have a lot of indicators but the problem that we, we have, in my opinion, is that uh, we have a huge barrier in disseminating our, uh, uh, our conclusions and, and outcomes. So more and more, we are making more sophisticated uh, techniques in uh, analyzing the data. And that is taking us away from not only the general public, but also even from from academia because we get more and more specialized and we only understand each other and our research group in the international uh, sociological association the european sociological association those groups are getting more and more uh, um, uh, segregated uh, within their own uh, specific niche and and the, the results and outcomes of our uh, research are not uh, reaching a wider audience so I think that in a way, uh, I think in my opinion, uh, the artistic practice and artists could be uh, could receive that kind of information and try to interpret it in their own terms and help maybe to to expand the the, the message because we don't have such a, a, a such a huge awareness of what is going on in terms of inequality in terms of um, poverty in terms of social stratification between different social classes so my idea is more around that but not only what, what is common than to make data visualization look nice i'm not that interested in that i um, it's more about how an artist can interpret that data as they interpreted all those uh, uh, topics related to climate change and, and, and climate emergency. Yeah, I think maybe we'll take one response from Marcos now. You were reacting strongly. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I would like to give the floor to another uh, question. I'll just make a comment. I actually don't have an answer for you, Manuel. I think this is extremely interesting. I do know that uh, companies, also high tech companies, are uh, hiring uh, researchers at different ends, also artists. Uh, I do know of some artistic projects that have been trying to use and manipulate uh, information from um, social media to uh, try to get to extract uh, knowledges or ideas from it that are different than what uh, artificial intelligence has been doing, for example, or, or even manipulating artificial intelligence for doing it. Um, but I couldn't tell you exactly <laughs> how that goes. I think uh, it's just something to be aware of. But in order to have the discussion, we should have people with completely different uh, uh, experiences and backgrounds. Um, I don't have much to say about this, but I do know it's it's out there. 
Yeah, thanks. Uh, Manolo, I'm sure that we can keep going on this and we can maybe even in the chat, there can be more reactions to, to your question. But in the meantime, uh, Sandra, Sandra Larota also had uh, her hand up. Uh, do you want to speak directly? Yeah, feel free. Yeah. Yeah, I was, um, so I, I, I initially was doing my research more in a, a participatory action research. And now it's like at the intersection of also artistic methods. And so what I found is that um, maybe it's also about how we can include methodologies uh, that have at the core care um like like from feminist studies like this is happening obviously but i was wondering like if you have experiences also in this merging of because i don't know for like for the the outside per perspective that i have for artistic uh, methods it's maybe that it can be like isolated you know like this typical stereotypical that we have like the artist like you know like but i, I think it's in, in this case, in this specific intersection, is also how do we integrate care in methodologies? And I don't know if you have like, you know, examples, references where this is already happening. Uh, so yeah, thank you. Um, Sophia Vibeck, maybe you have some thoughts on this with your experiences, just guessing. Um. Yes, I'm thinking about this. Uh, one way of thinking about it is when I talked about this re uh, rehearsals in the beginning, the research project that were part of my PhD, uh, and they like one of the object objectives were to like to stabilize the room. It was also very very important to work with care all the time, because it's also can be um, very. Um, what do you say, very uh, unpleasant to come into a room when everything is destabilized and everything is changing and you don't know how to act, etc. So there we talked a lot about how to create a very careful and caring situation and on this, on, in order to be able to investigate and explore something new. So, um, but that was more a co-productive project as well but uh but i think care is very very important to to consider all the time um yeah yeah sandra i hope this answered a bit of your your question and and you can again get in touch also with uh with the speakers um Sousa actually had a question here as well <laughs> Yeah, we don't seem to have more questions from the audience at this point, so I will ask here in between. So uh, democracy and reaching wider communities have been mentioned a lot during the discussion here today, and we have had some really inspiring examples of the arts-based research methods also, but would any of you have any examples of how can we read somehow different communities through these arts-based methods than with the more traditional science-based methods? for example, kind of um, where can we, in a way, expand our participation networks with these kind of methods? Anyone? <laughs> this can really be a dialogue as well. Like, if can you... I, um... Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> so just, uh, I don't think if, I, if it's very interesting uh, coming, coming to the scale of production of information that we have come to nowadays. But uh, in the case of Sao Paulo, well, I stress that uh, we're dealing with a um, city which is extremely unequal, right? Which inequality actually uh, has been a drive in how the city has developed. Um, uh, for the um, Architecture Biennale in 2018, we have many different groups uh, who, who identify themselves as artists and uh, with whom we collaborated to forge new pieces or new different works that we saw were capable of um, documenting uh, at that moment how um, peripheral agents, it's how they call themselves, peripheral, 
uh, could um, or were actually producing things that weren't really being acknowledged, but that defined completely uh, how uh, the neighborhoods saw themselves and how they could also express how they saw themselves to uh, the city. This is extremely interesting in terms of planning because it shows completely new um, layers of uh, reading the city and who is doing this, who are actually local artists who have agencies in their own uh, areas. And this reviewed, uh, incredible uh, maps which are related to affection to how people see themselves or to identity to a plurality of ways of being in the city which weren't really accounted for so i think uh, by means of uh, research and what they were doing and how they were uh, doing things on the ground um, it was possible to produce an image of the city or an imaginary of the city, which is extremely political, right? Like in the terms of what uh, Miraf Tabfarnak puts it, uh, but which um, is also something uh, acting into a new direction. I think this uh, shows very interesting pathways for, for the future and what we have seen in, in Sao Paulo specifically. So um, is it art, but it's, it's like actually capable of revealing a complete new truth and an idea of what the city is. I think it's rather important, right? Uh, reframing how history tells stories, how history decides which stories can be told and which ones cannot. And so the, uh, in, in this line of, of thought. Definitely. Rainer, you raise your hand. Yes, Manolo mentioned earlier in relation to kind of data heavy social uh, studies that and sciences that arts could be a, a medium for communication to audiences, but also between these kind of segregated or sectored uh, social scientists themselves. And and we we can all of course imagine what role can can art have uh, in terms of engaging uh, stakeholders and participants. Also in planning, if it if we think of how we visualize our maps, how we visualize our plans and produce different sorts of 3D renderings, etc., to to help people better kind of imagine the contents of the of the physical plans, but but uh, there are a, an important source of manipulation also and and hiding critical information that is needed so there are two sides it, it can be uh, provide a medium to better communicate planning and provide a kind of a shared shared uh, shared tools for for the participants and and planners so that the plans are uh, the plan contents are conveyed in a, in a way that are more familiar to the the residents and other participants, but there are also they can be used also in quite manipulative ways, and and thereby to a, a means of control of the participants and stakeholders. So I think there is also an important role for research to identify how these arts-based and visualization-based methods are actually used in relation to to whether they add uh, democracy in planning or actually diminish it. Thanks, thanks for that. I think um, if I may reflect on that a moment myself, I think there's, uh, it, it's of course, there's also this differentiation between uh, research, the research itself using arts practices. And I think we heard here some examples that where people you're doing research with uh, or about might be using artistic methods to express themselves, uh, right? And then the other part is using arts to present results of research and then being sort of creative and artistic in that. Um, but it's interesting that you say that that it's kind of, um, yeah, manipulative, uh, I think you said, uh, because where is research not 
really. <laughs> I wonder if science is not always, <laughs> right, in some way manipulative in its in its communication. Um, and maybe arts is actually a way to uh, be more explicit and honest about that. Uh, I don't know. That's a, another hypothesis, I guess. Um, I wouldn't make, make that conclusion. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I don't know if someone wants to react to that. Otherwise, I have one final question and then we go to a closing. But maybe if there's a pressing reaction. No? <laughs> okay. Just very briefly, art can also manipulate, right? So everything can manipulate, I think. Uh, and this is why both practices... Uh, are uh, necessarily political right in in their intentions yeah certainly yeah yeah and i think it's i, I don't know i mean uh, sophia grieves you've worked in in post growth and all this i mean that's also always very much a sort of you know a con contendent uh contentious um concept right and where where the people um sort of very in favor of it and people very not in favor of it but then you know it, that yeah i think using arts there seems seems really exciting anyways um i really recommend also for all the audience to be uh looking into the this panel's um other work because <laughs> i think you'll find really a lot of inspiration there um but i wanted to to ask one final question before we close which is um actually about uh one thing that that came up a little bit uh, is the power of grants and the power of of how much you know space is given because um, I've actually been struggling on one hand in my own research if I have a grant to do research and then I use an artistic method in it I'm quite free to do that but if I'm an artist I might need to get funding for that art or if I'm a researcher that is struggling to get any funding and, and I'm I'm trying to be open about what I want to do then how right how do we how have how have you each kind of navigated that space for um for being given the opportunity to you know support that action and I think Maybe here I, I want to give maybe a, two sentences for each of you, if if that works, more or less, um, just to wrap up on that, like what's how that has worked for you. Um, uh, Sophia Greaves, do you want to start there? Sorry, if I just want to check I've understood the question right. Is so how do I create give myself the opportunity? To, yeah, to well, use no, yeah, and and to what extent have grants sort of been either yeah. helpful or not <laughs> in that in a way? Um, I suppose my experience of grant writing for the research with arts based methods is typically to use the language that they want, um, and then do what I would like with that um time if I secure the funding, and unfortunately. I guess in antithesis to everything we've said today, that means emphasizing the importance of communication and um, or, you know, for innovation as broadly conceived, I mean, generally conceived for the kind of goals that they would like. Mm -hmm. um, but I suppose that is maybe true of grant writing for post growth more generally, which isn't exactly a hot um, funded topic sometimes because of its contention. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh. Um, Marcos, let's go with you next. I agree with what Sofia says. So I think there is one language uh, when you apply for a grant, you um, need to, uh, that's, uh, I've also been critical towards that today, right? So you need to uh, state exactly what you're going to do, how you're going to do, and what your outcomes are going to be according to your hypothesis, which is very problematic because uh, the true thing is that everything is changing all the time uh, the ideas the settings uh, what you're reading the references so actually research is also going to change i think in terms of um, how we also need to write and apply to those things um, um, it's also a very uh, uh, it's not a very open area right so it's it still is in that way i think uh, generally it should be done that way there are some exceptions and some specific grants where they say no we are um 
and specifically looking into things uh, people that are seeing this differently i know about this for example in the uk uh, some some grants in switzerland and germany but very specific so i think um uh, it is generally accepted at the end that uh, if everything changes you obviously have an explanation for that because that's what research is so i think that's that's how it works as i said i was lucky to also have the chance to apply and to get grants that uh, allowed us to work very freely and uh, this was extremely important also hard to get i mean some of them we struggled for a long time to get but um then you can work uh, in a different fashion because i think it's also related to ethics and how you work with people because if you're not working alone then um, if only you have the money it's not enough so you have also to understand uh, how to share how to understand mutual relevance uh, how to inquire for that uh, how to listen to people and to actually uh, give back yeah. Heine, very briefly if you have any input on yes that. i in applying for research funding i've had to play the game of science but but as i said in the in the beginning uh, there are scientific research approaches that incorporate uh, aspects of artistic uh, activity like like future studies so not all uh, artistic approaches are non-scientific there is not necessarily a contradiction between them certain artistic approaches can be scientific and legitimate for scientific research funding Sophia Wiebeck. Um, yes, I, I want to add that I think if you want to work with like artistic practices and so on, uh, that I also want to to um, he help not only giving like money for a specific project, but also for more long term uh, possibilities for production, both like spaces for art and culture and production. So within this research school, we have some partners and some of these partners are like the region of Stockholm and, and different municipalities, but we also included um, a citizen house that works a lot with culture and uh, to promote like culture and, and the art. Um, and that is one way of like, giving yeah this more long-term conditions for for the possibility of artistic practices yeah yeah i think i uh thanks thanks to all i think just to to say i think my intention was also to realize there's also funding tricky funding issues with uh the artists that we might engage if we engage people that are professionally artists uh, that can also be be a challenge but let's leave it at that and, and Sousa will wrap up uh, for now and I'm, I think we will all keep in touch I hope and and the audience as well please do yeah exactly we are approaching the ending lines of the webinar for today and uh, we would first like to start by thanking you all first the participants for their inspiring and well argumented dialogue that we had here with amazing examples and then also with the audience with their great questions and remarks and uh, today we have explored the relations between arts and science in planning with this thought-provoking dialogue and next time we will continue with the theme of temptations of seeking or rejecting mental comfort in planning and how that might uh, impact change and this webinar will be on the 13th of may and the registration link um, will be available in the chat in a moment if not already now and uh, in addition to that, we are also launching a new podcast with Kim any day now, uh, where we will explore the more than human futures in planning and beyond. So also extending the understanding of change dynamics also beyond humans as the only actors uh, in the urban uh, cities and the link to this one will also be available in the chat uh, any moment now and uh, but until this uh, thank you for being here today with us and for taking the time to participate in the webinar yes thank you so much thank you bye bye thank you, so much. Thank you. Thank you.